Chapter One of Shorty McCabe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Shorty McCabe by Sewell Ford. Chapter One. Excuse me, Mister Man, but ain't you? Hello, yourself. Blamed if I didn't think there was something kind of natural about the looks as you come piking by. How they runnin', eh? Well, say, I ain't seen you since we used to hit up the grammar school together. You've seen me, eh? Oh, sure, I'd forgot. That was when you showed up at the old athletic club the night I got the belt away from the kid. Doing sportin' news then, wa'n't ya? Chucked all that now, I suppose. Oh, I've kept track of you all right. Every time I sees one of your pieces in the magazines, I reads it. And say, some of em's kind of punk. But then you've got to sling out something or other, I expect, or get off the job. Where do you dig up all of them yarns, anyway? That's what always sticks me. You must knock around a whole bunch and have lots happen to you. Me? Ah, nothing ever happens to me. Of course I'm generally on the move, but it's just along the grub track, and that ain't exciting. Yes, it's been a couple of years since I quit the ring. Why? Say, don't ever put that up to a has-been. It's almost as bad as compounding a felony. I could give you a whole raft of reasons that would sound well, but there's only one that covers the case. There's a knockout coming to the best of em, if they hang to the game long enough. Some ain't satisfied even after two or three. I was. I got mine clean and square, and I ain't ashamed of it. I didn't raise any holler about a chance shot, and I didn't go exhibiting myself on the stage. I slid into a quiet corner for a month or so, and then I dropped into the only thing I knew how to do, training comers to go against the champs. It ain't like pulling down your sixty percent of the gate receipts, but there's waste paying jobs. Of course, there's times when I find myself up against it. It was during one of them squeezes not so long ago that I gets mixed up with Leonidas Dodge and all that foolishness. Ah, it wasn't anything worth wasting breath over. You would? Honest? Well, it won't take long, I guess. You see, just as my wad looks like it had shrunk so that it would rattle around in a napkin ring, someone passes me the word that Butterfly was down to win the third race at fifteen to one. Now, as a general thing, I don't monkey with the ponies, but when I figured up what a few saw books would do for me at those odds, I makes for the track and takes the high dive. After it was all over and I was coming back in the train with only a ticket where my roll had been, me feeling about as gay as a Zulu on a cake of ice, along comes this Mr. Dodge that I didn't know from next Tuesday week. Is it as bad as that, says he, sizing up the woe on my face, because if it is, they ought to give you a pension. What was the horse? Butterfly, says I. Now laugh. I've got a right to, says he. I had the same dope. Well, you see, that made us almost second cousins by marriage, and we started to get acquainted. I looked him over careful, but I couldn't place him within a mile. He had points enough, too. The silk hat was a veteran. The Prince Albert dated back about four seasons but the gray gaiters were down to the minute. Being an easy talker, he might have been a book agent or a green goods distributor, but somehow his eyes didn't seem shifty enough for a crook, and no con man would have lasted long wearing the kind of hair that he did. It was a sort of lemming yellow, and he had a lip decoration about two shades lighter, tagging him as plain as an inspected label on a tin trunk. I'm a mitt juggler, says I, and they call me Shorty McCabe, What's your line? I've heard of you, he says. Permit me. And he hands out a pasteboard that read, Leonidas Macklin Dodge, Commissioner at Lodge. For what, says I? It all depends, says Mr. Dodge. Sometimes I call it a brass polisher. Then again, it's a toothpaste. It works well either way. Also, it cleans silver, removes grease spots, and can be used for a shaving soap. It is a product of my own laboratory. None genuine without the signature. How does it go as a substitute for beef and, says I. I've never quite come to that, says he, but I'm as close now as it's comfortable to be. 
my gold reserve counts up about a dollar thirty nine you've got me beat by a whole dollar says i then says he you better let me underwrite your next issue there's a friend of mine up to forty second street that ought to be good for fifty says i i've had lots of friendships off and on says he but never one that i could cash in at a pinch i'll stay by until you try your touch well the forty second street man had been gone a month there were others i might have tried but i didn't like the risk getting my fingers frostbitten so i hooks up with leonidas and we goes out with a grip full of electro polisho hitting the places where they had nickel-plated signs and brass handrails and say i could starve to death doing that give me a week and two pairs of shoes and i might sell a box or so but dodge he takes an hour to work his side of the block and shakes out a fistful of quarters it's an art says he which one must be born to after this you carry the grip that's the part i was playing when we strikes the tuscarora sounds like a parlor car don't it but it was just one of those swell bachelor joints fourteen stories electric elevators suites of two and three rooms for gents only course we hadn't no more call to go there than to the stock exchange but leonidas macklin he's one of the kind that don't wait for cards seeing the front door open and a crowd of men in the hall he blazes right in silk hat on the back of his head hands in his pockets and me close behind with the bag what's up auction row or accident says he to one of the mob now if it had been me that butted in like that i'd had a row on my hands in about two minutes but in less time than that leonidas knows the whole story and is right to home taking me behind the handmade palm he puts me next seems that someone had advertised in a morning paper for a refined high-browed person to help one of the same kind kill time at a big salary and look what he gets says leonidas waving his hand at the push there's more than a hundred of em and not more than a dozen that you couldn't trace back to a mills hotel they've been jawing away for an hour trying to settle who gets the cinch the chap who did the advertising is inside there in the middle of that bunch and i reckon he wishes he hadn't as an act of charity shorty i'm going to straighten things out for him come on better call up the reserves says i but that wasn't mr dodge's style side stepping around to the off edge of the crowd just as if he'd come down from the elevator he calls out good and loud now then gentlemen one side please one side ah thank you in the moment now gentlemen we'll get down to business and say they opened up for us like it was payday and he had the cash box we brought up before the saddest looking cuss i ever saw out of bed i couldn't make out whether he was sick or scared or both he had flopped in a big leather chair and was trying to wave him away with both hands while about two dozen looking like ex-bath rubbers or men noises were telling him how good they were and shoving references at him the rest of the gang was trying to push in for their whack it was a bad mess but leonidas wasn't fiazed a bit attention gentlemen says he if you will retire to the room on the left we'll go to work the room on the left gentlemen on the left and he had a good voice leonidas did one of the kind that could go against a merry-go-round or a german band the crowd stopped pushed to listen then someone made a break for the next room and in less than a minute they were all in there with the door shut between mr dodge tips me the wink and sails over to the specimen in the chair you're mr homer fails i take it says he i am says the pale one breathing hard and who who the devil are you that's neither here nor there says leonidas just now i'm a lifeboat do you want to hire any of these fellows if so no 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 says homer shaking as if he had a chill send them all away will you they have nearly killed me away they go says leonidas watch me do it first he has me go in with his hat and collect their cards then i calls em out one by one while he stands by to give each one the long-lost brother grip and whispers in his ear as confidential as if he was telling them how he'd won the piano at a church raffle don't say a word 
tomorrow at ten. They all got the same, even to the hickey boy's shoulder pad as he passed them out, and every last one of them faded away trying to keep from looking tickled to death. It took twenty minutes by the watch. Now, Mr. Fales, says Leonidas, coming to a parade rest in front of the chair, next time you want to play Santa Claus to the unemployed, I'd advise you to hire Madison Square Garden to receive in. That seemed to put a little life into Homer. He hitched himself up off in the middle of his backbone, pulled in a yard or two of long legs, and pried his eyes open. You couldn't call him handsome and prove it. He had one of those long two-by-four faces, with more nose than chin, and a pair of inset eyes that seemed built to look for grief. The corners of his mouth were sagged, and his complexion made you think a cheese pie. But he was still alive. "'You've overlooked one,' says he, and points my way. "'He wouldn't do it all. Send him off, too.' "'That's where you're wrong, Mr. Fales,' says Leonidas. "'This gentleman is a wholly disinterested party, and he's a particular friend of mine. "'Professor McCabe, let me introduce Mr. Homer Fales.' So I came to the front and gave Homer's flipper a little squeeze that must have done him as much good as an electric treatment by the way he squirmed. If you ever feel ambitious for a little six-ounce glove exercise, says I, just let me know. Thanks, says he, thanks very much, but I'm an invalid, you see. In fact, I'm a very sick man. About three rounds a day would put you on your feet, says I. There's nothing like it. He kind of shuddered and turned to Leonidas. You are certain that those men will not return, are you? says he. Not before tomorrow at ten. You can be out then, you know, says Mr. Dodge. Tomorrow at ten, says Homer, and slumps again, all in a heap. Oh, this is awful, he groans. I couldn't survive another. It was the worst case of funk I ever saw. We put in an hour trying to brace him up but not until we promised to stay by overnight could we get him to breathe deep. Then he was grateful as if we'd pulled him out of the river. We half lugs him over to the elevator and takes him up to his quarters. It wasn't any cheap hangout either. Nothing but silk rugs on the floor and parlor furniture all over the shop. We had dinner served up there, and it was a feed to dream about. Oysters, ruddy duck filly of beef with mushrooms and all the frills, while Homer worries along on a few toasted crackers and a cup of weak tea. As Leonidas and me does the anti-famine act, Homer unloads his hard-luck wheeze. He was the best example of an all-around invalid I ever stacked up against. He didn't go in for no halfway business. It was neck or nothing with him. He wasn't on the hospital list one day and bumpin' the bumps the next. He was what you might call a consistent sufferer. It's my heart, mostly, says he. I think there's a leak in one of the valves. The doctors lay it to noise, some of them, but I'm certain about the leak. Why not call in a plumber, says I. But you couldn't chirk him up that way. He believed in the leaky heart of his for years. It was his stock and trade. As nearly as I can make out, he began being an invalid about the time he should have been hunting a job, and he'd always had someone to back him up in it until about two months before we met him. Foist it was his mother, and when she gave out, his old maid sister took her toyne. Her name was Joyfina. He told us all about her, how she used to fan him when he was hot, wrap him up when he was cold, and read to him when she couldn't think of anything else to do. But one day Joyfina was thoughtless enough to go off somewhere and quit living. You could see that Homer would never quite forgive her for that. It was when Homer tried to find a substitute for Joyfina that his troubles began. He had all kinds of noises, but the good ones wouldn't stay, and the bad ones he'd fired. He tried valets, too, but none of them seemed to suit. Then he got desperate and wrote out that ad that brought the mob down on him. He gave us a diagram of exactly the kind of man he wanted, and from his plans and specifications we figured out that what Homer was looking for was a cross between a galley slave and a he-angel, someone who would know just what he wanted before he did and be ready to hand it out whenever called for. 
and he was game to pay the price, whatever it may be. You see, says Homer, whenever I make the least exertion or undergo the slightest excitement, it aggravates the leak. I'd seen lots who ducked all kinds of exertion, but mighty few with so slick an excuse. It would have done me good to have said so, but Leonidas didn't look at it that way. He was a sympathizer from headquarters, seemed to like nothing better to hear Homer tell how bad off he was. What you need, Fails, says Leonidas, is the country, the calm, peaceful country. I know a nice, quiet little place about a hundred miles from here that would just suit you, and if you say the word, I'll ship you off down there early tomorrow morning. I'll give you a letter to an old lady who will take care of you better than four trained nurses. She has brought half a dozen children through all kinds of sickness, from measles to broken necks, and she's never quite so contented as when she's trotting around waiting on somebody. I stopped there once when I was a little hoarse from a cold, and before she let me go to bed, she made me drink a bowl of ginger tea, soak my feet in hot mustard water, and bind a salt pork poultice around my neck. If you'd just go down there, you'd both be happy. What do you say? Homer was doubtful. He never lived much in the country and was afraid it wouldn't agree with his leak. But early in the morning he was up to wanting to know more about it. He began to think of that mob of snap hunters that was booked to show up again at ten o'clock, and it made him nervous. Before breakfast was over, he was willing to go almost anywhere. Only he was dead set that me and Leonidas should trail along too. So there we were, with Homer on our hands. Well, we packed a trunk for him, called a cab, and got him loaded on the parlor car. About every so often he'd clap his hands to his side and groan. Oh, my heart, my poor heart. It was as touching as the heroine speeches to the top gallery. On the way down, Leonidas gave us a bird's eye view of the kind of Jim Crow settlement we were heading for. It was one of those places where they date things back to the time when Lem Saunders fell down the cellar with a lamp and set the house afire. The town looked it. There was an aggregation of three men, two boys, and a yellow dog inside of Main Street when we landed. We'd wired ahead, so the old lady was ready for us. Leonidas called her Mother Bickle. She was short, about as thick through as a sugar barrel, and wore two kinds of hair, the front frizzes being a lovely chestnut. But she was a nice-spoken old girl, and when she found out that we brought along a genuine invalid with a leak in his blood pump, she almost fell on our necks. In about two shakes she'd hustled Homer to a rocking chair, wedged him in place with pillows, wrapped a blanket around his feet, and shoved him up to a table where there was a hungry man's layout of clam fritters, canned corn, boiled potatoes, and hot mince pie. There wasn't any use for Homer to register a kick in the bill of fare. She was too busy telling him how much good the things would do him, and how he must eat a lot or she'd feel bad, to listen to any remarks of his about toasted crackers. For supper there was fried fish, applesauce, and hot biscuit, and Homer had to take his share. He was glad to go to bed oily. She didn't object to that. Mother Bickle's house was right in the middle of the town, with a grocery store on one side and the post office on the other. Homer had a big front room with three windows on Main Street. There was a strip of plank sidewalk in front of the house so that you didn't miss any footfalls. Mother Bickle could tell who was going by without looking. Leonidas and me put in the evening hearing her tell about some of the things that had happened to her oldest boy. He'd had a whirl out of most everything but an earthquake. After that, we had an account of how she buried her two husbands. About ten o'clock, we started for bed, dropping in to take a look at Homer. He was sitting up, wide awake, and looking worried. "'How many people are there in this town?' says he. "'About a thousand, says Leonidas. "'Why?' Then they have all marched past my windows twice, says Homer. Shouldn't wonder, says Leonidas. They just been off to the post office and back again. They do that four times a day. But you mustn't mind. Just you thank your stars you're down here where it's nice and quiet. Now I'd go to sleep if I was you. Homer said he would. I was ready to tear off a few yards of repose myself, but somehow I couldn't connect. 
it was quiet all right in spots fact is it was so blamed quiet that you could hear every rooster that crowed within half a mile if a man on the other side of town shut a window you knew all about it i was getting there though and was almost up to the dropping off place when some folks in a back room on the next street begins to indulge in a family argument i didn't pay much notice to the preamble but as they warmed up to it i couldn't help from getting the drift it was all about the time of year that a fellow named of hen dorset had been run over by the cars up to jersey city i say it was just before thanksgiving pipes up the old lady i know cuz i was into the butchers asking what turkeys would be likely to fetch when doc bruisewater drops in and says mornin f heard about hen dorset and then he told about him falling under the cars so it must have been just afore thanksgivin thanksgivin your grandmother growls the old man it was in march along the second week i should say because the day i heard of it was just after school election march of eighty three that's when it was eighty three squeals the old lady are you losing your mind altogether it was eighty five the year jimmy cut his hand so bad at the sawmill jimmy wasn't waking at the sawmill that year raps back the old man he was tonguing oysters that fall cause he didn't hear a word about hen until the next friday night when i told him myself hen was killed on a monday it was on a saturday or i'm a lunatic snaps the old lady well they kept on piling up evidence each one making the other out to be a fool or a liar or both until the old man says see here maria i'm going up the street and ask a's horner when it was that hen dorset was killed a's knows for he was the one mrs dorset got to go up after hen yes and he'll tell you it was just before thanksgivin of eighty five so what's the use says the old lady we'll see what he says growls the old man and i heard him strike a light and get into his shoes who are you betting on says leonidas gee says i are you awake too i thought you was asleep an hour ago i was says he but when this hen dorset debate breaks loose i came back to earth i'll gamble that the old woman's right the old man's mighty positive says i wonder how long it'll be before we get the returns perhaps half an hour says leonidas he'll have to thrash it all out with ace before he starts back we might as well sit up and wait anyway i want to see which gets the best of it let's have a smoke then says i why not go along with the old man says leonidas if he finds he's wrong he may come back and lie about it well it was a fool thing to do when you think about it but somehow leonidas had a way of looking at things that was different from other folks he didn't know any more about that there hen dorset than i did but he seemed just as keen as if it was all in the family we had hustled our clothes on and was sneaking down the front stairs as easy as we could when we hears from homer i heard you dressing says he so i got up too i haven't been asleep yet then come along with us says leonidas it'll do you good we're only going up the street to find out when it was that the cars struck hen dorset homer didn't savvy but he didn't care mainly he wanted company he whispered to us to go easy suspecting that if we woke up mother bickle she'd want to feed him some more clam fritters by the time we'd unlocked the front door though she was after us but all she wanted was to make homer wrap a shawl around his head to keep out the night air and don't you dare take it off until you get back says she homer was glad to get away so easy and said he wouldn't but he was a sight looking like a turk with a sore throat the old man had routed ace horner out by the time we got there and they was having it hot and heavy ace said it wasn't either november nor march when he went up after hen dorset but the middle of october he knew because he'd just begun shingling his kitchen and the line storm came along before he got it finished more than that it was in eighty four for that was the year he ran for sheriff see here gentlemen says leonidas isn't it possible to find some official record of this sad tragedy you'll excuse us being strangers for taking a hand but there don't seem to be much show of our getting any sleep until this thing is settled besides i'd like to know myself now let's go to the records i'm ready says ace 
If this thick-headed old idiot here don't think I can remember back a few years, why, I'm willing to stay up all night to show him. Let's go to the county clerks and make him open up. So we started, all five of us, just as the town clock struck twelve. We hadn't gone more than a block, though, before we met a whiskered old relic stumping along with a stick in his hand. He was the police force, it seems. Of course, he wanted to know what was up, and when he found out, he was ready to make affidavit that Hen had been killed sometime in August of 81. One night one of the pallbearers, says he, and hadn't I just drawn my back pension and paid off the mortgage of my place, eh? No use routing out the clerk to ask such a fool question, and anyways, he ain't home, come to think of it. If you'll permit me to suggest, says Leonidas, there ought to be all the evidence needed right in the cemetery. Of course there is, says Ace Homer. Why didn't we think of that first off? I'll get a lantern and we'll go up and read the date on the headstone. There were six of us lined up for the cemetery, the three natives drawing away as to who was right and who wasn't. Every little ways someone would hear the racket, throw up a window, and chip in. Most of them asked to wait until they could dress and join the procession. Before we'd gone half a mile, it looked like a torchlight parade. The bigger the crowd got, the faster the recruits fell in. Folks didn't stop to ask any questions. They just jumped into their clothes, grabbed lanterns, and piked after us. There were men and women and children, not to mention a good many dogs. Every one was jabbering away, some asking what it was all about and the rest trying to explain. There must have been a good many wild guesses, for I heard one old feller in the rear rank squalling out. Remember, neighbors, nothing rash now, nothing rash. I couldn't figure out just what they meant by that at the time, but then the whole business didn't seem any too sensible, so I didn't bother. On the way up I'd sort of fell in with the constable. He couldn't get anyone else to listen to him, and as he had a lot of unused conversation on hand, I let him spiel it off at me. Leonidas and Homer were ahead with Ace Homer and the old duffer that started the row, and the debate was still going on. When we got to the cemetery, Homer dropped out and leaned up against the gate, saying he'd wait there for us. We piled after Ace, who made a dash to get to the headstone first. It's right over in this section, says he, waving his lantern, and I want all of you to come and see that I know what I'm talking about when I give out dates. I want to show you by ginger that I've got a memory that's better than any diary ever wrote. Here we are now. Here's the grave, and... Well, darn my eyes. Bless if there's any sign of a headstone here. And there one neither. By jinx, says the old constable, slapping his leg. That's one on me, boys. Why, Lizzie Dorset told me last week that a mother had the stone took up and sent away to have the name of a second husband cut on it. Why, only last week, she told me, and here I'd clean forgot it. You're an old billy goat, says A's Horner. There, there, says Leonidas, soothed him down. We've all enjoyed the walk, anyway, and maybe. But just then he hears something that makes him prick up his ears. What's the row back there at the gate, he asks. Then, turning to me, he says, Shorty, where's Homer? Down there, says I. Then come along on the jump, says he. If there's any trouble lying around loose, he'll get into it. Down by the gate we could see lanterns by the dozen, and we could hear all sorts of yells and excitement, so we makes our move on the double. Just as we fetch the gate, someone hollers. There he goes! Lynch the villain! We sees a couple of long legs strike out, and gets a glimpse of a head wrapped in a shawl. It was Homer, all right, and he had the gang after him. He took a four-foot fence at a hurdle and was streaking off through a plowed field into the dark. Hi, Fails, sings out Leonidas. Come back here, you chump. But Homer kept right on. Maybe he didn't hear, and perhaps he was too scared to stop if he did. All we could do was to get into the free-for-all with the others. What did he do, yells Leonidas at a sandy-whiskered man who carried a clothesline and was shouting, Lynch him! Lynch him! between jumps. Do, says the man. Ain't you heard? 
Why, he choked Mother Bickle to death and robbed her of seventeen dollars. He's wearing her shawl now. As near as we can make out, the thing happened like this. When the tail-enders came rushing up with all kinds of wild yawns about robbers and such, they catch a sight of Homer leaning up in the shadow of the gate. Someone holds a lantern up to his face, and an old woman spots the shawl. It's Mother Bickles, says she. Where'd he get it? That was enough. They went for Homer like he'd set fire to a synagogue. Homer tried to tell him who he was and about his heart, but he talked too slow, for his voice wasn't strong enough, and when they began to plan on yanking him up then and there, without printing his picture in the paper or a trial, he heaves up a yell and lights out for the boarding house. Ten hours before I wouldn't have matched Homer against a one-legged man, but the way he was getting over the ground then was worth the price of admission. I have done a little track work myself, and Leonidas didn't show up for any glue foot, but Homer would have made the tape ahead of us for any distance under two miles. He'd cleared the crowd and was back into the road again, traveling wide and free, with the shawl streaming out behind the nearest Avenger two blocks behind us, when out jumps a Johnny-on-the-spot citizen and gives him the low tackle. He was a pussy bald-headed little duffer, this citizen chap, and not being used to blocking runs, he goes down underneath. Before they could untangle, we comes up, snakes Homer off the top of the heap, and skidoos for all we had left in us. By the time that crowd of jayhawkers comes booming down to Mother Bickles to view the remains, we had the old girl up and settin' at the front window with a light behind her. They asked each other a lot of foolish questions, and then concluded to go home. While things was quietin' down, we were making a grand rush to get Homer to bed before he passed in altogether. Neither Leonidas nor me looked for him to last more than an hour or two after that stunt, and we were thinkin' of takin' him back in a box. But after he got his breath, he didn't say much except that he was plumb tired. We were still wonderin' whether to send for a doctor or the coroner, when he rolls over with his face to the wall and goes to sleep as comfortable as a kitten in a basket. It was in the middle of the forenoon before any of us shows up for breakfast. We'd inspected Homer once, about eight o'clock, and found him still sawin' wood, so we didn't try to get him up. But just as I was opening up my second egg, down he comes, walking a little stiff, but otherwise as good as ever, if not better. How far was it that I ran last night, Mr. Dodge? says he. About a mile and a half, says Leonidas, stating it generous. And it was a good amateur sprintin' as I ever saw. Homer cracked the first smile I'd seen him tackle and pulled up to the table. I'm beginning to think, says he, that there can't be much of a leak in my heart after all. When we get back to town tonight, Mr. McCabe, we'll have another talk about those boxing lessons. Eggs? Yes, thank you, Mrs. Bickle. About four, soft. And by the way, Dodge, what was the date on that gravestone, anyway? End of chapter one. Chapter two of Shorty McCabe by Sewell Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What do we do with Homer, eh? Ah, forget it. Say, soon's he's got back to town and found he could navigate round by himself, he begins to count up expenses. Then he asks us to put in a bill. Bill, says I. What for? I'm no hired man. I've been doing this for fun. Leonidas says the same. But Homer wouldn't have it that way. He says we've done him a lot of good and lost our valuable time, and he'll feel hoit if we don't let him make us a little present. With that, he pries open a fat leather green goods case, paws over a layer of yellow backs two or three inches thick, and fishes out a couple of ten spots. Stung, says Leonidas, under his breath. Homer, says I, shoving him back at him, if you're as grateful as all that, I'll tell you what you'd better do. Keep these, and found a home for incurable tightwads. Then we loses him in the crowd, and each of us strikes out for himself. Blessed if I know where Leonidas strayed to, but 
but I'm dead sure of the place I fetched up at. It was Italy, North Italy. Ever been there? Well, don't. Nothing but dagoes and garlic and roads that run uphill. Say, some day when my roll needs the anti-fat treatment, I'm going to send over there and have him put up a monument that'll read, Here's where Shorty McCabe was buried alive for five weeks. Doing? Wasn't a blamed thing doing there. We was just assassinating time, that's all. But the boss thought he'd liked it for a while, so I had to hang on. The boss? Oh, he's just the boss. Guess you wouldn't know him. He hasn't been cured by three bottles of anything, and isn't much for buying billboard space. But he's a star, all right. He's got a mint somewhere, a little private mint of his own, that runs days and nights and overtime. Scotty mine? No, better than that. Defunct grandmothers and such. It's been coming his way ever since he was big enough to clip a coupon. Don't believe he knows how much he has got, but that don't worry him. He don't even try to spend the gate receipts, just uses what he wants and lets the rest pyramid. Of course, he's out of my class in a way, but then again, he ain't. The way we come to hook up was like this. You see, when I quits Homer, I takes the first thing that comes along, which happens to be the Jericho Lamb. He wants me to train him for his go with Grasshopper Jake, and I did. Well, we pulls it off in Denver. The lamb he bores in like a stone crusher for five rounds. Then he stops a cross hook with his jaw and his jawed some. That brings out the yeller. Spite of all I could say, he stops rushing and plays for wind and safety. Think of that, with the grasshopper as groggy as a five days old calf. Well, I saw what was coming to him right there. When the bell rings, I chucks my towel to the rubber and quits. I hadn't hired out for no wet nurse, and I told the crowd so. Just as I was making my sneak, this quiet-speaking chap falls in alongside and begins to talk to me. First off, I sized him up for one of them English Johnnies that had lost his eyeglass. But that's where I was dead wrong. He wasn't no Johnny, and he wasn't no tin horn sport. But he was a new one on me. They don't grow many like him, I guess, so no wonder I didn't get wise right away. Think the lamb's all in, says he. All in, says I. He never had anything to put in. He was licked before the bell tapped. And me training him for five weeks. I'm going to kick myself all the way back to New York. I'll help you, says he. I back that lamb of yours to win. How much, says I. Oh, only a few hundred. But you ain't seen him licked yet, says I. I'll take your word for it, says he. Say, that was no tin horn play, was it? He goes off and leaves his good money up, just on a flyer like that. You're the real good, says I. I can return the sentiment, says he. So we took the midnight east. When we got the morning papers at Omaha, we saw that Lamb only lasted halfway through the seventh, and Possum the count at that. Well, we got some acquainted before we hit Chicago, and by the time we landed in Jersey City, I'd signed articles with him for a year. He calls it secretary, but I holds out for sparring partner. Oh, he can handle the mint sum, all right. None of your parlor YMCA business, either. But give and take. He strips at 140 and can stand punishment like a stevedore, but of course there's no chance of ever getting him on the platform. He likes to go his four rounds before dinner, just to take the drab coloring off the world in general. That's the way he puts it. Take him all around. He's a thoroughbred. I know that much, but after that I don't follow him. I used to wonder sometimes, given most Johnnies his pile and turn him loose, and what would they do? They'd wear out the club window sills and take in pink teas and do the society turn. But not for him. He's a mixer, the boss is. He wants to see things, all kinds. Sometimes he lugs me along and sometimes he don't. It all depends on whether I'd fit in. When he heads for Fifth Avenue, I know I'm let out. But when he gets into a sack coat and derby hat, 
I'm betting that maybe we'll fetch up somewheres on the east side. Perhaps it'll be the grand annual ball of the Truck Drivers Association, or just one of them anarchist talk fests in the back room of some beer parlor. There's no telling. We may drink muddy coffee out of dinky brass cups with a lot of Syrian rug sellers down on Washington Street, or drop into the middle of a gang of sailors down on Front Street. And I'm no bodyguard, mind. The boss ain't in much need of that, but he likes to have someone to talk to, and I guess most of his friends don't go in for such promiscuous visiting lists as he does. I like it well enough, but where he gets any fun out of it, I can't see. I put up to him once, and what do you suppose he says? He asks me if I ever heard of a duck by the name of Pansy de Leon. Sounds kind of familiar, says I. Don't he run a hotel or something down to Palm Beach? You're warm, says the boss, but you've mixed your dates. Old Pansy struck the East Coast about four hundred years before our friend Flagler annexed it, and he wasn't in the hotel business. Exploring was his line. He was looking for a new kind of mineral water that he was going to call the elixir of life. Well, in some ways, Pansy and I are alike. It was all Josh, all right, that he was handing out, but he meant something by it, for the boss ain't the kind to talk just for the sake of making noise. I never let on but what I was next. Later in the season, I had a chance to come back at him with it. For along in February, we got under way for Palm Beach ourselves. Going to take a hack at the Lixer business? I says. No, shorty, says he. Just going to dodge a few blizzards and watch the mob. But he didn't like it much, being in that push, so we took a jump over to Bermuda, where everything's so white it makes your eyes ache. That didn't suit him either. Shorty, says he one day, you didn't sign on for any outside tour, but I've got the go fever bad. Can you stand it a while in foreign parts? I'm game, says I, not knowing what I was to be up against. So we hiked back to New York and Mr. Rankin's. He's the ladylike gent that stays home and keeps our trousers creased and juggles the laundry bag and so forth when we're there. Mr. Rankin's, he packs a couple of steamer trunks and off we starts. Well, we hit a lot of outlandish places like Paris and Berlin and finally, when things began to warm up some, and I knew by the calendar that the hokey pokey men had come out on the Bowery, we lands in Monte Carlo. Say, I'd heard a lot about Monte Carlo on and off, and there was a song about it once, you know, but if that's the best imitation of Phil Daly's they can put up over there, they better go out of business. Not that the scenery is bang up and the police protection okay, but the game? Well... I've seen more excitement over a ten-cent ante. The boss didn't care much for that sort of thing anyway. He touched him up for a stack or two, but almost went to sleep over it. It wasn't until old Bluebeak butted in that our visit began to look interesting. He was a count or a duke or something, with a name full of I's and L's, but I called him Bluebeak for short. The boss said for a miniature word painting, that couldn't be bettered. Never saw a finer specimen of hand decorated frontspiece in my life. It wasn't just red nor purple. It was as near blue as a nose can get. Other ways, he was a tall, skinny old freak with a dyed mustache and little black eyes as shifty as a fox terrier's. He was as polite, though, as a book agent and as smooth as a business side of a banana skin. What's his game, says I to the boss, after Blue Beak and him had swapped French conversation for an hour. Is it gold bricks or green goods? My friend the Count, says the boss, wants to rent us a castle, all furnished and found, a genuine antique with a pedigree that runs back to Mark Antony. A castle, says I. What's that the cue to, and how did he guess you were a come on? Every American is a come-on, shorty, said the boss. But this is a new proposition to me. However, I mean to find out. I've told him to come back after dinner. And old Bluebeak had his memory with him all right. He came back. He and the boss had a long session of it. In the morning, the boss says to me, Shorty, throw out your chest. 
you're going to live in a castle for a while. Then he told me how it happened. Bluebeak wasn't any con man at all, just one of those hard up gents whose name looks well on a list of guests, but don't carry weight with the pay and teller. He was in such a rush to get the ranch off his hands, though, that price didn't seem to figure much. That's what made the boss sit up and take notice. He was a great one for wanting to know why. We'll start today, says he. So off we goes, moseying down into Italy on a bum railroad, staying at bummer hotels, and switching off to a rickety old chaise behind a pair of animated frames that showed the SPCA hadn't gotten as far as Italy yet. Think of riding from the battery to White Plains in a Fifth Avenue stage. That would be a chariot race to what we took before we hove in sight of that punky castle. After that, it was like climbing three sets of palisades, one top of the other, on a road that did the corkscrew all the way. That's your castle, is it? says I, rubbering up at it. Looks like a storage warehouse stranded on Pike's Peak. Gee, but I wouldn't like to fall out of one of those bedroom windows. You never hit anything for an hour. Handy place to have company, though. Wouldn't have to put up the potatoes until you saw them coming. So that's a castle, is it? I don't wonder old Bluebeak had a lot of conversation to unload. If I live up there all summer, I shall accumulate enough talk to last me the rest of my life. Oh, don't imagine we'll be lonesome, puts in the boss. I fancy I caught a sight of one or two of our neighbors on the way. You did, says I. Where? Behind the rocks, says he, kind of snickering. But I never savvied. I'd had my eyes glued to that Dago Waldorf Astoria balanced up there on that toothpick of a mountain. I had a batty idea the next whiff of breeze would jar it loose. When they'd open up a gate like the double doors of an armory and let us in, I forgot all that. Say, that castle was the solidest thing I ever run across. The walls were so thick that the windows looked like they were set at the end of tunnels. In the middle was a big court, such as they have in these swell new apartment houses, and a lot of doors and windows opened on that. Much as eleven rooms and bath, eh? says I. The count assures me that there are two hundred and odd rooms, not reckoning the dungeons, says the boss. I hope we'll find one or two of them fit to live in. We did, just about that. A white-headed old villain who looked as if he'd just escaped from a Pirates of Penzance chorus, Vincenzo, he called himself, took our credentials and then showed us around the shop. There was a dining room about the size of the Grand Central train shed. Say, a Harlem man would have wept for joy at sight of it. And there was a picture gallery that had Steve Brody's collection beat a mile. As for bedrooms, there was enough to accommodate a state convention. The only running water in sight, though, was in the fountain out in the court, and the place looked as though when the gas man made his last call, he'd taken the fixtures along with the meter. Yet the boss seemed to be tickled to death with the whole shooting match. At dinner that night, he made me sit in one end of the dining room table while he sat at the other, and we were so far apart we had to shout at each other when we talked. The backs of some of those dining room chairs were more than eight feet tall. It was like leaning up against a billboard. The waiters looked like stage villains out of a job, and whenever they passed the potatoes, I peeled my eye for a knife play. It didn't come, though. Nothing did. We put in nearly a week rummaging through that moldy old barracks. It was three days before I could come down to breakfast without getting lost. The boss found a lot to look at and paw over. Old books and pictures, rusty tin armor and such truck. He even poked around in the coal cellars that they had called dungeons. I liked being up in the towers best. I'd go up there and look about due west where New York was the last time I saw it. I never wanted wings quite so bad as I did then. And say, I'd even given up a month's salary for a sport and extra some nights. Dull? Why, there are crossroads up in Sullivan County that would seem like the tenderloin alongside of that place. Funny thing, though, was that the boss was so stuck on it. 
he gas about the lakes and the mountains and the sky and all that pointin em out to me as if they were worth seein when i'd seen better than that many a time painted on backdrops and could get away from em when i wanted but here it was a case of nowhere to stay but in you couldn't go pikin around the landscape without fallin off the edge guess i'd have gone clean nutty if it hadn't been for the little glove play we did every afternoon we had some of the chorus hands fix up a nice lot of straw in a corner of the courtyard so's to sort of upholster the paving stones and after we got used to the new footwork it was almost as good as a rubber mat we'd been having a gingery little go one day with the whole crew of the castle from the head poiser down to the second assistant pan wrestler holding their breath in the background and i was playing shower bath for the boss with a leather bucket dripping out of the fountain pool and sousing it over him when i spots a deadhead in the audience she'd been playing peekaboo behind one of them big stone pillars but i guess she had got so interested that she forgot and stepped out into the open she was a native all right but say she wasn't any back row dago girl she was in the prima donna class she was ever see melba made up for the common act well this one was about half melba's size but for shape and color she had her stung to a whisper and as for wardrobe she had it all on gold hoops in her ears tinkly things in a jacket and a rainbow dress with the reds and greens leading the field eyes were her strong point though regular forty candle powers she had the current all switched on too and a plum center range on the boss now he wasn't exactly in reception costume the boss wasn't when he'd knocked off his running shoes it left him in a pair of salmon trunks and cleared the knees considerable he made a fine ad for a physical culture school just as he stood for he's well muscled and his underpinning mates up and he don't interfere when he walks the cold water had brought out the baby pink all over him and he looked like one of these circus riders does on the four sheep posters he had the limelight too for a streak of sun coming down between the towers just hit him i see the girl wasn't missing any of these points it wasn't any snapshot she was taking it was a time exposure who's your lady friend in the wings says i to the boss where says he i jerks my thumb at her for a minute there wasn't a word said the boss wasn't able i guess and the girl never moved an eyelash then he yells for the bath towel and makes a break inside me after him when we'd rubbed down and got into our broadway togs we chases back and organizes ourselves into a board of inquiry who was she regular boarder or just transient where did she come from and why likewise how trolley subway or balloon but i'm blessed if that whole gang didn't go as mum as a lot of railroad hands after a smash-up why they hadn't seen no such lady cross their hearts they hadn't maybe it was old rosa yes and rosa a sylph that would fit tight in a pork barrel a goat then let's give em the third degree says i so we done it locked em all in the room and put em on the carpet one by one they was scared stiff too stiff to talk all but old vincenzo the white-haired old pirate the count had left in charge he was a lovely pea-green under the gills but he made a stagger at putting up a game of talk no he hadn't seen no one he had been watching their excellencies in their affair of honor still he couldn't swear that we hadn't seen someone folks did see things at the castle he had seen sights himself though generally after dark he remembered a song about a beautiful young lady who back in the seventeen hundred and something had but i shut him off there this fairy might have seen seventeen summers or maybe eighteen but she's no antique i could kiss the book on that she was a regular casino broiler i made a point of this it didn't fiaze the old sinner though he went on perjuring himself as cheerful as a paid witness and he'd have broken the ananias record if he had time that will do for now says the boss in a kind of step up front there tone if you don't know who she was just now we'll let it go at that 
but by tomorrow you'll know the whole story. It'll be healthier for all hands if you do. Vincenzo, though, didn't have a proper notion of what he was up against. Next day he knew less than the day before. He was ready to swear the whole outfit by all the saints in the chapel that there hadn't been a girl on the premises. Bring him along, Shorty, says the boss, starting downstairs. There's a hole in the sub-cellar that I want this old pirate to look through. If that hole had been cut for an ash chute, it was a dandy, for the muzzle of it was a mile, more or less, from anything solider than air. We skewered Vincenzo's arms to the small of his back and let him down by the heels until he had a bird's-eye view of the three counties. Then we pulled him up and tested his memory. It worked all right. That upside-down movement had shook up his thought works. He was as anxious to testify as the front benches at a Bowery mission on soup day. We loosened the cords a bit, set him where he could see the chute plain, and told him to blaze away. Lucky the boss knows Italian, for the Vincenzo couldn't separate himself from English fast enough. But they had me guessing what it was all about. I couldn't make out why the old chap was using up all the dago words in the box just to tell who was the lady that had the private view. Once in a while the boss would jab in a question, and then Vincenzo would work his jaw all the faster. When it was all over, the boss looks at me as pleased as though he'd got money from home and says, Shoity, how's your noive? Not much below pa, says I. Why? Because, says he, they are after us. Brigands. Brigands, says I. Tut, tut. Don't tell me that this dead and alive country can show up anything like that. It can, says he. The woods are full of them. Then he gives me the framework of what old Vincenzo has been telling him. The prima donna girl, it seems, was a lady brigandess, daughter of a heavy villain that led the bunch. She's come in to size us up and make an estimate as to what we'd fetch on a forced sale. They had spotted us from the time we registered and had been hanging around outside, laying for us to separate. Their game was to pinch one of us and do business with the other on a cash basis. Wanted someone left who could go away and cash a check, you see. When we didn't show no disposition to take after-dinner promenades or before-breakfast rambles, they ups and tells Vincenzo that they wants the run of the castle and promises to toast his toes if they don't get it. They don't have to promise but once, for Vincenzo has been through the mill. It was this kind of work that had queered the count. According to Vincenzo, old Bluebeak had been pat-crowed regular every season for five summers, and the thing had got on his nerves. Well, Vincenzo lets three or four of em in one day, just as the boss and me were swapping uppercuts and body punches in the courtyard. Maybe they didn't like the looks of things. Anyway, they hauled off and sent for the main guy, who was busy down the line a ways. He comes up with the reserves, and his first move is to send the goyle in to get a line on us. And that was the way things stood up to date. Who'd a thought it, says I. The way she looked at you, I suspicion she marked you out as something good to eat. That turned the boss red behind the ears. I'm afraid we'll have to ask for her visiting card next time she calls, says he. Come, Vincenzo, I want you to show me about locking up. After that, no one came or went without showing a pass, and I lugged about four pounds of brass keys around, for we didn't want to be stood up by a gang of moth-eaten brigands loaded with old hardware. They covered close by day, but at night we could see em sneaking round the walls, like a bunch of second-story men new to their job. Neither the boss nor I had a gun, never having had a call for such a thing. But we found a couple of old blunderbusses hung up in the hall, regular junk shop relics, and we unlimbered them, loading with nails, scrap iron, and broken glass. Of course, we couldn't hit anything special, but it broke the monotony for both sides. Once in a while, they'd shoot back, just out of politeness, but I don't believe any of them took any metal at a shoutsin fest. This lasted for two or three nights. It wasn't such bad fun either for us. The party of the second part, though, was off on a vacation like we were. They were out rustling for money to pay for the landlord and butcher, 
and they were losing time. Hard working lot of brigands they were, too. I wouldn't have monkeyed around after dark on that perpendicular landscape for twice the money, and I don't believe any of them drew more than union rates. Fact is, I was getting to feel almost sorry for them, when one night something happened to give me the marble heart. I'd been making my rounds with the brass foundry, seeing that all the tramp chains were on, putting out the cat and coming to Shore Acres act. When I see something dark, skidoo across the court to where the boss stood smoking in the moonshine by the fountain. I does a sprint, too, and was just about to practice a little 11th Avenue jiu-jitsu on whoever it was, when Flip goes a piece of black lace, and there was the lady brigandess, some out of breath, but still in the game. She opens up on the boss in a stage whisper that whirls him around as if he'd been on a string. Not wanting to butt in ahead of my number, I sort of loafed around just outside the ropes, but near enough to block a foul. Now, I don't know just all they said, nor how they said it, but from what the boss told me afterward, they must have had a nice little confab that would be the real thing for a grand opera if someone would only set it to music. Seems that she'd found out, the lady bringing this had, that the old man's gang had run across a bricked-up passageway down in the corner of the basement, a kind of all-goods-must-be-delivered-here gate that had been thrown into the discards. Of course, they'd gone to work to open it up, and they'd got as far as some iron bars that called for a hacksaw. They'd sent off for their breaking and entering kit, meaning to finish the job next day. The following night, they'd planned to drop in unexpected, so the boss up in his blanket before he could make a move and caught him off until I could bail him out with a peck or so of real money. The rest of the scene the boss never would fill in just as it came off the bat, but I managed to piece out that the brigandist, sizing us up for a couple of pikers, reckoned that we wouldn't pan out much cash, and that the boss might be used some rough by the gang. That prospect not settling well in her mind, she rolls out the back door of their camp, makes a swift trip around to our new private entrance, squeezes through the bars, and comes up to put us wise. It must have been just as she got to them lines that the boss began taking a good look at her. I saw him gazing into her eyes like he'd taken out a search warrant. Don't know as I could blame him much, either. She was a top-liner. Wasn't anything coy or kittenish about her. She stood up and gave him as good as he sent. Next I see him make the only fool play but one that I ever knew the boss to make. Regular kid trick. Here, says he, pulling off the big carbuncle ring he always wears. That's to remember me by. She didn't even look at it. No jewelry for hers. Instead, she says something kind of low and sassy, pokes her face up and begins to pucker. The boss, he sort of sidesteps and squints over his shoulder at me. Now, I'm not saying what I'd do if a girl like that gave me the sissy loftus eye. It ain't up to me. But I know what I'd want the crowd to do. And I did it. When I turned around again, they was just at the breakaway, so it must have been one of the bye-bye forever kind, such as you see at the dock on sailing day. Then she took us down to show us how she came in and squeezed herself through the bars. She shook hands just once, and that was all. That night there was a grand howl from the brigands. They had put in hours of real work, the kind they'd figured on cutting out after they got into the brigand business, only to run into a burglar-proof shutter which we had put up. They pranced around to the front gate and shook their fists at us, and called us American pigs, and invited us to come out and have our ears trimmed, and a lot of nonsense like that. I wanted to turn loose the blunderbusses, but the boss said, No, let them enjoy themselves. How long do you suppose they'll keep that sort of thing up, says I? Vincenzo says some of them will stay around all summer unless we buy them off, says he. That's lovely, says I, for anyone that's dead gone on the life here. I'm not, says he. I can't get out of here too quick now. Oh, ho, says I, meaning not much of anything. 
being kept awake by their racket that night, I got to thinking how we could give that gang of grafters the double cross. There wasn't any use making a back alley dash for it, as we didn't know the lay of the land, and they were between us and New York. But most of the fancy thinking I've ever done has been along that line. How to get back to Broadway. Along toward morning, I throws five aces at the flip, turns up an ID that had been at the bottom of the deck. It's a winner, says I, and goes to sleep happy. After breakfast, I digs through my steamer trunk and hauls out a four-ounce can of aluminum paint that the intelligent Mr. Rankins had mistook for shaving soap and put in before we left home. Then I picks out a couple of suits of that tin armor in the hall, a medium-sized one and a short-legged, forty-fat outfit, and I gets busy with my brush. "'What's up?' says the boss, seeing me slinging on the aluminum paint. Been reading a piece on how to beautify the house in the ladies' home companion, says I. Got any burnt orange ribbon about you? It was a three-hour job, but when I was through, I'd renovated up that cast-off toggery so that it looked as good as if it had been just picked from the bargain counter. Then I waited for things to turn up. The brigands opened the ball as soon as it was dark. They'd rigged up a battering ram and allowed they'd meant to smash in our front door. The boss laughed. That gate looks as if it had stood a lot of that kind of boy's play, and I guess it's good for a lot more, says he. Now, if they were not hopelessly medieval, they would try a stick of dynamite. We could have poured hot water down on them or dropped a few bricks, but we didn't. We just let them skin their knuckles and strain their backs on the battering ram. About moonrise, I sprung my scheme. What do you say to throwing a scare into that bunch of back numbers, says I? How, says the boss. I led him down to the court, where I laid out the plated tinware to dry. Think you can fit yourself into some of that boiler plate, says I. That hit the boss in the short ribs. We tackled the job offhand, me strapping a section on him, and he clamping another one on me. It was like dressing for a masquerade in the dark, neither of us ever having worn steel boots or harveyized vests before. Some of the joints didn't seem to fit any too close, and a lot of it I suppose we got on hindside front and upside down. But in the course of half an hour we were harnessed for fair, including a conning tower apiece on our heads. Then we did the march past just to see how we looked. With a little white muslin, you could do to go on as the ghost in Hamlet, says the boss through his front bars. You sound like a junk wagon coming down the street, says I, and you're a fair imitation of a tin shop on parade. Shall we go for a midnight stroll? I'm ready, says the boss, grabbing up a couple of two-handed skull splitters that I'd laid out to finish our costumes. We swung open the gate and sashayed out, calm and dignified into the middle of that bunch of brigands. It wasn't hardly a square deal, of course, they being brought up on a steady diet of ghost stories, and I reckon there was a spooky look about us that sent a frappe wireless up and down those dago spines. But after all, it was the banana oil the aluminum paint was mixed with that toyed the trick. Smelled it, haven't you? If there's any perfume fitter for a lost soul than a tar of banana oil, it hasn't been discovered. First they went bug-eyed, next they sniffed, and the second sniffed one big duffer with rings on his ears and a fine assortment of second-hand pepper boxes in his sash, digs up a scared yell that would have done credit to one of these wux tree, wux tree boys, and then he skidoos into the rocks like someone had tied a can to him. That set em all off, same's when you light the green cracker at the end of the bunch. Some yelled, some groaned, and some made no remarks. But they faded, inside of two minutes by the clock we had the front yard to ourselves. Coyton, says I to the boss, this is where we do a little disappear in ourselves before they get curious and come back. We hustled into the castle, pried ourselves out of our tin roofing, chucked our dunnage into the Blue Beak's best carry-all, hitched a couple of auction-house steppers, 
and lit out on the town trail without so much as stopping to shake a da-da to old Vincenzo. I didn't breathe real deep, though, until we fetched sight of a little place where the mountain left off and the Dago police was supposed to begin. Just before we got to the first house, we see something up on a rock at one side of the road. They was coming, red and sudden, and we saw who it was on the rock. The lady brigandess, sure thing. Now, don't tax me with how she got there. I'd quit trying to keep cases on her. But there she was, waiting for us. As we got in line, she glued her eyes on the boss and tossed him a lip thriller with a real Juliet Roxanne movement. And the boss blew one back. Well, that suited me all right, so far as it went. But as we made for a turn in the road, the boss reached out for the lines and pulled in our pair of the skates. Then he turns and looks back. So did I. She was still there, for a fact, and it kind of looked as if she was holding her arms out towards him. "'By God, Shorty,' says the boss, breathing quick and talking through his teeth, "'I'm going back.' "'Sure,' says I, "'to New York, and I had a half Nelson on him before he knew it was coming. We went four miles that way, too, the horses finding the road before I dared to let him up. I looked for trouble then.' but it had been all over within a breath, just an open and shut piece of battiness, same as fellers have when they jump a bridge. He was meek enough the rest of the way, but sore. I couldn't pry a word out of him anyway. Not until we got settled down in the smoking room of a Mediterranean steamer headed for Sandy Hook did he shake his trance. Shorty, says he, giving me the friendly palm, I owe you a lot more than apologies. Well, I ain't no collection agency, says I. Sponge it off. I was looking for the elixir, says he, and and I found it. I can get all the elixir I want, says I, between the East River and the North, and I don't need no cork puller either. That's me. I've been back a week now, and even the screech of the L train sounds good. Everything looks good and smells good and feels good. You don't have to pinch yourself to find out whether or not you're alive. You know all the time that you're in New York, where there's something doing twenty hours in the day. Italy? Oh, yes, I want to go there again. When I get to be a mummy. End of chapter two. Chapter three of Shorty McCabe by Sewell Ford. This LibriVox recording's in the public domain. Say, you can't always tell, can you? Here a couple of weeks back, I thought I'd wiped Italy off the map. We'd settled down in this little old boig, me and the boss and Mr. Rankins, nice and comfortable, and not too far from Broadway. And we was having our four o'clock teas with the mitts as regular as if there was money coming to us for each round, when this here Sherlock proposition turns up. Mr. Rankins, he was the first to spot it, and he comes trotting in where we was prancing round the mat, his jaw loose and his eyebrows propped up like Eddie Foy's when he wears his salary face. It's most unaccountable, sir, says he. Time out, says I, blocking the boss's pet uppercut. Mr. Rankins seems to have something in the place where his mind ought to be. Hankins, says the boss, putting down his guard reluctant, haven't I told you never to... Yes, sir, yes, sir, says Mr. Hankins. But there's that outrageous thing fast to the door, and law at me, sir, I can't pull it off. The boss, he looks at me, and I looks at the boss, and then we both look at Mr. Hankins. Seeing as how he couldn't reveal much with that cheese pie face of his, we goes and takes a look at the door. It was an outside one, just as he gets off the elevator. And there was something there, too. The dizziest kind of a visiting card that was ever handed out, I suspicion, in those particular swell chambers for single gents. It was a cuff, just a plain everyday wrist chafer, pinned up with the wickedest little blood letter that ever came off the knife rack. 
half an inch of the blade stuck through the panel, so the one who put it there must have meant that it shouldn't blow away. The boss jerks it loose, sizes it up a minute, and says, Stiletto, eh? Made in Firenze. That's Florence. Shorty, have you any friends from abroad that are in the habit of leaving their cutlery around promiscuous? I know folks as far west as Hoboken, if that's what you mean, says I. But there ain't none of them in the meat business. Well, we takes the thing inside under the bunch light and has another squint. He is writing in red ink, says I, and holds up the cuff. Read it, says the boss. I could play it better on a flute, says I. You try. We didn't have to try hard. The minute he skinned his eye over that, his jaw goes loose like he'd stopped a body wallop with his short ribs. It's Tuscan, says he, and it means that someone's in trouble and wants help. Do they take this for a police headquarters or a charity organization, says I? Looks to me like a new kind of wireless from the wash lady. Why don't you pay her? That's one of my cuffs, says the boss. It's too well ventilated to get into that bag again, says I. Shorty, says he, letting my Joe Webber go over his shoulder. Do you know where I saw that cuff last? It was in North Italy. Then he figured out by the queer laundry marks just where he'd shed this identical piece of his trousseau. We left it with a few mementos just as valuable when we made the quick move away from that punky old palace after our little monkey shine with the brigands. You don't mean, says I, but there wasn't no use wasting breath on that question. He was blushing. We fiddled some on its having come from old Vincenzo, or maybe from Bluebeak, the count that rented us the place. But the minute we tied that cuff up with the castle, we knew that the one who sent it meant to ring up a hurry call on us for help, and that it wasn't anybody but the lady brigandess herself, the one that put us next and kept the boss from being sewed up in a blanket. That's a hey rube for me, says I. How about you? But the boss was kicking off his gym shoes and diving through his shirt. In five minutes by the watch, we were dressed for slootin'. I know a dago roundsman, says I. No police in this, says the boss. Guess you're right, says I. Too much limelight and too little headwake. We'll cut the cops out. Where to first? I'm going to call the Italian consul, says the boss. He's a friend of mine. So we opened the sloop business with a ride in one of those heavyweight electric hansoms, telling the throttle pusher to shove it wide open. Maybe we broke the speed ordinance some, but we caught Mr. Consul on the fly, just as he was punching the time card. He wore a rich set of Peter Cooper whiskers, but barring them, he was a well-finished old gent with a bow that was an address of welcome all by itself. The way that he shoved out leather chairs, you'd thought he was making a present of them to us. But the boss hadn't any time to waste on flourishes. We got right down to cases. He wanted to know about where the Tuscans usually headed for when they left Ellis Island, what sort of gangs they had in New York, and what kind of black-hand deviltry they were most given to. He asked a hundred questions and never answered one. Then he shook hands with Mr. Consul and we chased out. It looks like the Malabistos, says the boss. They have a kind of headquarters over a basement restaurant. Perhaps they've shut her up there. We'll take a look at the place anyway. A lot of good it did us, too. The spaghetti wakes was in full blast, with a lot of husky lowbrows going in and out, smoking cheroots half as long as your arm, and acting as if the referee had just declared a draw. The opening for a couple of bare-fisted investigators wasn't what you might call promising. Not having their grips and passwords, we didn't feel as though we could make good on their lodge. I could round up a gang and then we could rush em, says I. That wouldn't do, says the boss. Strategy is what we need here. I'm just out of that, says I. Perhaps there's a back door, says the boss. So we moseys around the block, hunting for a family entrance. But that ain't the way they build down in Mulberry Bend. They chucks their old rookeries slam up against one another to keep them from falling over, I guess. Generally, though, 
There's some sort of garlic flew through the middle of the block, but you need a balloon to find it. Hist, says I. Hold me head while I thinks a thunk. Didn't I come down here once to watch a tryout? Sure, and it was pulled off in the palatial parlors of Appetite Joe Cardenzo's Chowder Association, the same being the back room two flights up. Now, if we could dig up Appetite Joe... We did. He was around the corner playing scope for brandied plums. But he let go the cards long enough to listen to my fairy tale about wanting a joint where I could give my friend a private lesson. Sure, says Joe, passing out the key. But you break it the chair, I charge a fifty cent. There were two back windows, and the view wasn't one you'd want to put in a frame. Down below was our court filled with cold boxes and old barrels and perfumed like the lee side of a barren island. But catty corners across was the back of that spaghetti mill. We could tell it by the two-decker billboard on the roof. In the upper windows we could see dago women and kids, but the windows on the second floor were black. Iron shutters, says the boss, and that's where she is, if anywhere. Got a scaling ladder or a jimmy in your pocket, says I. Then I'll have to run around to a three-ball exchange and see if I can't dig up an outfit. A patent fire escape and a short-handled pickaxe was the best I could do. We made the board jump up fast inside and down I went. Then there was acrobatics, swinging across to the three-inch window ledge, balancing with one foot on nothing, and single-hand work with the pickaxe. Lucky that shutter bar was half-rusted away. She came open with a bang when she did come, and it near sent me down into the barrels. Me eyelashes held, though, and there I was, up against the window. See anything, says the boss. Room the rent, says I, for it looked like we pried open the vacant flat. Just then, the sash goes up and something shiny glitters in the dark. I was just letting go with one hand to swing for a head when someone lets loose a dago remark that was mighty businesslike and more or less familiar. Is it you, says I? If you're the lady brigand this own up sudden. Ah, says she, thankful-like, as if she'd seen a horse win by a nose. Then she puts up the rib tickler and grabs me by the wrist. Guess your lady friend's here, I sings out to the boss. Have you got her, says he. No, says I, she's got me. But no sooner does she hear him than she lets go of me, shoves her head out the window and calls up to him. The boss says something back and for the next two minutes they swap dago talk to beat the cars. How shall I pass her up, says I. Just then she made a spring for that rope ladder of ours and overhands up like a trapeze star. And me thinking we'd need a derrick or a boss's chair. It wasn't no time for reunions at that stage of the game, nor for hard luck stories either. None of us was pining to hold any sociables with the Malabistos. We quit the chowder club on the jump, streaked up the hill into Mott Street, and piled into one of those fuzzy two-horse chariots that they keep hooked up for weddings and funerals. Where to, says the bone thumper. Headed for Buffalo and let loose to beat the Empire State Express, says I. But hunt for asphalt. That fetched us up 2nd Avenue, but there wasn't any conversing done till we put 50 blocks behind us. Then I reckon the boss asked the lady brigandess if she missed any meals lately. From the way he gave orders to steer for a food refinery, she must have allowed that she had. Not having time to be particular, we hit a goulash emporium where they spell the meat cards mostly with CZs. But they gave us a private room upstairs, which was what we wanted, and it wasn't until we got inside that we had a full-length view of her. Say, I was glad we landed so far east of Broadway. Post me for a welcher if she wasn't rigged out in the same kind of a chorus costume that she wore when we saw her last over there in Italy. Only it was more so. It was the kind of costume that'd been all right on a cigarette card or outside a Luna Park joint, and it would let her into the Orion Ball without a ticket, but it wasn't built for circulating round New York in. Piffle, piffle, says I to the boss. They'll think we've pinched her out of a Caralfi ballet. Hadn't we better send for your lady friend's trunk? The boss grinned, 
but he looked her over as satisfied as if she'd been dressed according to his own watercolor sketches. She was something of a star, yes, yes. If you were looking for figure and condition, she had em. And when it came to the color scheme, well, no grease paint manipulator ever mixed cafe au lait and raspberry pink the way it grew on her. For a maiden Italy girl, she was the real meringue. We'll see about clothes later, says the boss, and orders up seventeen kinds of skizedski to be served in the relays. She brought her appetite with her all right, even if she had mislaid her suitcase. And while she was pitching into what passes for grub on Second Avenue, she told the boss the story of her life. Leastways, that's what it sounded like to me. The way I gets it from the boss was like this. Her father, the old brigand Pentanta, couldn't get over the way we'd banished his bunch of third-rate kidnappers with our tin armor play. He accumulated a sort of ingrowing grouch and soured on the whole push because they wouldn't turn state's evidence as to who had given us the dope to do em. The lady brigandess, she had stood that for a while, until one day she gets her Irish up, tells the old man how she tipped us off herself, and then makes tracks out of the country. One way and another, she'd heard a lot about America, so she takes out yellow tickets on a few spare sparks and buys a steerage berth for New York. Well, she hadn't more than got past Sandy Hook before a Malabisto runner spotted her. So did the advance man of another gang. They sized up the gold hoops on her ears, her real money necklace, and some of the other furniture she sported, and they invited her to come to tea. Just how the scrap began or what it was all about, she didn't know, so the story by rounds hasn't been told. The next thing she knew, though, they had hustled her into the bend and bottled her up into that back room, but not before she'd done a little extemporaneous carving on her own account. I gathered that three or four of the Malabistos needed some plain sewing done on em after the bell rang, and that the rest wasn't so anxious for her society as at first. She'd been cooped up for two days when she managed to get hold of a Dago woman, who promised to carry that cuff to the place where old Vincenzo had told her we hung out in New York. So far, it's as good as playing leading heavy in the shadows of a great city, says I. But what's down for the next act? Where does she want to go now? Say, you thought the boss had been nipped with the goods on. He goes strawberry color to his ears. Next he takes a look across the table at her where she sits, quiet and easy, and as much to home as the lady Graftwad on the back seat of the tonneau. She was taking notice of him, too, kind of running over his points, like he was something rich she'd won at a raffle and was glad to get. But the boss, he braced up and looked me straight in the eye. Shorty, says he, I want to call your attention to the fact that this young lady is something like 3,000 miles from home, that we're the only two human beings on this side of the ocean she knows by sight, and that once she risked us a good deal to do us a service. I'll put my name to all that, says I, but what does it lead up to? Where do we exit? That, says the boss, is a conundrum. And she ain't got any program, says I. She, or that is, says the boss, trying to duck. She says she wants to go with us. Phew, says I, through my front teeth. This is so sudden. Just tell the lady, will ya, that I've resigned. No, you don't, shorty, says the boss. You'll see this thing through. But look at them soikis clothes, says I. I got no aunts or grandmothers or second cousins that I could unload a lady brigandess on. Nor I, says the boss. But he didn't look half so worried as he might. Say, when I came to figure out what we was up against, I could feel little cold storage whiffs on my shoulder blades. Suppose someone should meet you in the middle of a herald square, hand you a ring-tailed tiger, and then skidoo. What? That would be an easy one compared to our proposition. It wasn't a square deal to shake her, and she made up her mind not to stay put anywhere again. Wait here until I telephone someone, says the boss. Delighted, says I. Better ring up the Jerry Society, too, while you're about it. They might help us out. The lady brigandess and I didn't have a real sociable time when the boss was gone. 
I could see she was watching every move I made as much as to say, You can't lose me, Charlie. It was just as cheery as waiting in the sergeant's room for bail. When the boss does show up, he wears a regular breakfast food smile that made me leery, for when he looks tickled, it don't signify that things are coming his way. Generally, it only means that he's going to break out in a new spot. It just occurred to me, says he, that I had accepted an invitation from the Van Eubens for the opera. What kind of a bluff did you throw, says I? None at all, shorty, says he. I just asked if they would have room for three, and they said they would. Say, the boss don't need no nerve tonic, does he? You know about the Van Eubens, don't you? They weigh in at something like forty millions and are a good fifth on Mrs. Aston's list. Straight goods now, says I. You don't reckon to spring this aggregation on the diamond horseshoe, do you? We must put up in time somehow, says he. I thought it might be all grand Josh until I watched some of his moves. First, we drives over to Fifth Avenue and stops on one of those places where it says robes on a brass plate outside. The boss stays in there four minutes and comes out with a piece of dry goods that they must have stood him up a hundred for. Kind of an opera cloak, ulster length, all rusty black silk outside and white inside. The lady brigandess, she puts it on with no more fuss than if she'd been brought up on such things and had ordered this one a month ahead. Next, we heads for our own quarters, having shifted our Mott Street chariot for the real article, with rubber tires and silver-plated lamps. About that time, I got wise to the fact that the boss and her ladyship were ringing me into their talk, and I was getting curious. I see the boss shaking his head like he was trying to prove an alibi, and every once in a while pointing to me. First thing I knows, she quit his side of the carriage and was snuggling up alongside of me and cooing away in some outlandish kind of baby talk, and I was glad I didn't savvy. I made no kick, though, until she begins to pat me on the head. "'Call her off, will you?' says I. "'I'm no lost kid.' The young lady is just expressing her thanks, says the boss, to the gallant young hero who so nobly rescued her from the Malabistos. Don't shy, shorty. She says that anyone so brave as you needn't worry about not being handsome. He was kidding me, see. I knew he'd given us some fairy tale or other, but I didn't have any comeback that she could understand. I felt like a monkey, though, having my hair mussed and thinking maybe next minute she'd give me the knife. And the boss, he sat there grinning like a jack-lantern. I didn't get a chance to break away until we got to our own ranch. Then we left her sitting in the buggy while we went up to make a lightning change. Sure, I got a head waiter's rig, bought at the time I had to lead off the Grand March at the Tim Grogan Association's 10th Annual Ball, but I never looked to wear it out attending Grand Opera. I hope the Van Eubens will appreciate that I'm giving them a treat, says I. They'll be blind if they don't, says the boss. Is it your collar that hurts? No, it's the shoes, says I, but the pain'll numb down by the time we get there. We made our grand entry about the end of the second spasm. The Van Eubens had taken their corners. It was Papa Van Eubens, looking like ready money, and Mama Van Eubens made up regardless, and Sis Van Eubin, one of those tall Gainsborough girls that any piker could pick for a winner on form and past performance. Say, it took all the front I had in stock just to tag along as an also-ran, but when I thought of the boss, heading the procession, I was dead sorry for him. And what kind of game do you think he hands out? Straight talk, nothing but. Of course he didn't make no family history out of telling who his lady friend was, but as far as he went, it tallied with the card, even to letting on that she was a lady brigandess. Out we go now, says I to myself, and looks to see Mama Van Eubin throw a cat fit. But she didn't. She just squealed a little, same as if someone had tickled her behind the ear, and then she began slinging that goigly goigly new poor talk that Sixth Avenue sales ladies use. Sis Van Eubin caught the same cue, and to hear em, you thought the boss had done something real cute. They gave the lady brigandess the high-bridge wigwag and shooed her into a stage-corner chair. 
she never made a kick at anything until they tried to take away her cloak. Not much. She was just beginning to be stuck on that. She kept it wrapped around her like she knew the proprietor wasn't responsible for overcoats. The boss tried to tell her how there wasn't any grand larceny intended, but it was a no-go. She had her suspicions of the crowd, so they just had to let her sit there, draped in black. And at that, she wasn't any misfit. Now, I'd been inside the Metropolitan once or twice before, having blown myself to a standy just for the sake of looking at the real things with their war paint on. But I wasn't feeling any more to home in the back of that box than I would in the pilot house of an airship. But the lady brigandess didn't show no more stage fright than an auctioneer. She just holds her chin up and looks out at all the display of open work dressmaking and cut glass exhibit without so much as batting an eyelash. She was taking it all in, too, from the bargain hats in the family circle to the diamond tummy warmers in the pottery. But you'd never guess that she just escapes from a dago back district where they have one mail a week. If I hadn't seen her chumming with a hold-up gang that couldn't have bought fifteen-cent lodgings on the Bowery, I'd bet the limit that she was a thoroughbred in disguise. There was some rubber in that, of course, and I expect we had the safety vault crowd guessing as to what kind of a prize the Van Eubens had won, but it didn't fiaze her a bit. She just gave him a horse-show stare, as cool as a mint frappe. The ringing up of the curtain didn't disturb her any either. When a chesty baritone sauntered down toward the footlights and began calling the chorus names, she glanced over her shoulder, casual-like, just to see what the row was all about, and then went on sizing up the folks in the boxes. She couldn't have done it better if she'd taken lessons by mail. If she would only talk, gurgles Mrs. Van Eubin, doesn't she speak anything but Italian? Pure Tuscan is all she knows, says the boss, and the way she talks is better than any music you'll hear tonight. Wait until she has satisfied her eyes. Pretty soon the baritone quits jaw in the chorus, and a prima donna in spangled clothes comes to the front. Maybe it was Melba or Nordica. Anyway, she was an A-1 warbler. She hadn't let go of more than a dozen notes before the lady brigandess begins to sit up and take notice. First, she has a kind of surprised look, as if a ringer had been sprung on her. And then, as the high sea artist begins to let herself go, she swings around and listens with both ears. The music didn't seem to go in one side and out the other. It stuck somewhere between, and swayed and lifted her like a breeze in a posy bush. I could hear her toe tapping out the tune and see her head keep time to it. Why, if I could get my money's worth out of music like that, I'd buy a season ticket. When the prima donna had cut it off, with a voice way up in the flies somewhere, and the house had rose to her, as the bleachers do when one of the giants knocks a three-bagger, the lady brigandess was still sitting there, waiting for more. The trance didn't last long, though. She just cast one eye around the boxes, where the folks were splitting gloves and waving fans and yelling, Bravo, bravo, so that you'd have thought somebody carried Ohio by a big majority, and then she takes a notion to get into the game herself. Shucking that high-priced opera cloak, she jumps up, drops one hand on her hip, holds the other up to her lips, and peels off a kind of whoopee yodel that shakes the skylight. Talk about your corner bugle calls. That little ventriloquist pass of hers had him stung to a whisper. It cut through all that patter and screech like a siren whistle splitting a fishhorn serenade, and it was as clear as the ring of silver sleigh bells on a frosty night. After that, it was all up to her. The other folks quit and turned to see who had done it. Two or three thousand pairs of double-barreled opera glasses were pointed our way. The folks behind them found something worth looking at, too. Our brigandess wasn't in disguise any more. She stood up there at the box rail, straight as a Gibson girl, her black hair hanging in two thick braids below her waist, the gold hoops in her ears all a jingle, her little fringed jacket rising and falling, and her black eyes snapping like a pair of burning trolley fuses. We'll say, if she won the pastel, I never saw one. 
I guess the star singer thought so, too. She just smiled and nodded at the others, but she blew a kiss up to our lady before she left. Now, I don't know just what would have happened next if someone hadn't shown up at the back of the box and asked for the boss. It was the Italian consul that we'd been to see earlier in the day. Where'd you find her, says he. I mean, in who, says the boss. Why, her highness, the princess Padova. Beg pardon, says the boss. But if you been the young lady there, you're wrong. She's the daughter of a poor but honest brigand chief, and she's just come from Tuscany to discover New York. She's the princess Padova if I'm a Turk, says the consul. Ask her to step back here a moment. It sounded like a pipe dream, all right. Who ever saw a princess rigged out for the tambourine act and mixing with a lot of chestnut roasters? But old Whiskers had the evidence down pat, though. As he told it, she was sure enough a princess so far as the tag went, only the family had been in the nobility business so long that the pedigree had lasted out the plunks. It seemed that a way back, before the Chicago fire of the Sayers Heeningo, her great-grandpop had princed it in regulation shape. Then there'd come a grand mix-up, a war of something, and a lot of princes had either lost their jobs or got on the blacklist. Her great-grandpop had been one of the kind that didn't know when he was licked. They euchred him out of his castle and building lots, but he gathered up what was left of his gang and slid for the tall timber, where he went on princing the best he knew how. As he couldn't disgrace himself by working and hadn't lost a hankering for regular meals, he got into the habit of taking up contributions from whoever came along, calling it a road tax. And that's how the Padova family fell into playing the hold-up game. But the old man Padova, the princess's father, never forgot that if he'd had his rights, he would have been boss of his ward, and he always acted accordin'. So when he picked the consul up on the road one night with a broken leg, he gave him the best in the house, patched him up like an ambulance surgeon, and kept him aboard free until he could walk back to town. And so, when Miss Padova takes it into her head to elope to America with a tin trunk, Papa Padova hikes himself down to the nearest telegraph office and cables over a general alarm to his old friend, who's been made consul. I've been having Mulberry Ben raked with a fine-toothed comb, says he. But when I saw her highness stand up here in the box, I knew her at a glance, although it's been ten years since I saw her last. Then he asked her if he hadn't called the trick, and she said he had. Now, says he, perhaps you'll tell us why you came to America. Sure, says she, or something that meant the same. I've come over after me best feller and made up my mind that I'll marry him, and she slips an arm around the boss's neck, just as cool as though they'd been on a moonlight excursion. Mr. Consul's face gets as red as a fireman's shirt, and the Van Eubens catch their breath with both fists, and I begins to see what a lovely mess I'd been helping the boss get himself into. He never toined a hair, though. The honor is all mine, says he, just as if he meant every word of it. Ahem, says the consul, kind of steadying himself against the curtains. Perhaps it would be best, before anything more is said on this subject, for the princess to have a talk with my wife. We'll take her home. Well, they settled it that way, and I was mighty glad to get her off of our hands so easy. Next afternoon, the consul shows up at our ranch as gay as an upstate deacon who's seeing the town incog. Sir, he says to the boss, giving him the right hand of fellowship, you're a real gent, and after what you did last night, I'm proud to know you, and I'm happy to state that it's all off with the princess. Then he went on to tell how Miss Padova, being out of her latitude, hadn't got her book straight. She carried away with the notion that when a princess went out of her class, she had a right to sign on any chap that she liked the looks of, without waiting for him to make the first move. They did it that way at home. But when the consul's wife had explained the United States way and how the boss was a good deal of a rooster himself, with the real money enough to buy up a whole rink full of dago princes, why Miss Padova feels like a plush Christmas box at a January sale. She toins on the sprinkler, wants to know what they suppose the boss thinks of her, and says she wants to go back to Italy by the next trolley. But she'll get over feeling bad, says the consul, 
We'll ship her back next Friday, and you can take it from me that the incident is closed. I was looking for the boss to open a bottle or two on that, but he didn't. For a pleased man, he held in well. Poor little girl, says he, looking absent-minded toward the Bronx. Then he cheers up a minute. I say, do you mind if I run up and see her once before she sails? You may for all of me, says the consul, but if you'll listen to my advice, you won't go. He did, though, and lugged me along for a chaperone, which is some out of my line. I'm afraid they'd rather overdone the explaining business, says he on the way up, and while I had my own ideas as to that, I had sense enough for once not to butt in. That was an ice house call, all right. They left us on the mat while our cards went up, and after a while, the hired goyle comes down to give us the book agent glare. The missus, says she, says as how the young lady begs to be excused. Does the young lady know we're here, says the boss. She does, says the goyle, and shuts the door. Gee, says I, that's below the belt. The boss hadn't a word left in him, but I wouldn't have met him in the ring about then for anything less than the bookie's bundle. Just as we hit the sidewalk, we hears a front window go up and down comes a red rose plunk in front of us. Many happy returns of the day, says I, handing it to the boss. I suppose you're right, says he. It's the only way to look at it, I expect. And yet, oh, hang it all, shorty, what's the use? Arr, say, says I, switch off. It's all over, and you've sidestepped taking the count. End of chapter 3